welcome. I'm so glad to see that you all have joined us, whether it be in live or you're going to catch us on the replay. Either way, I'm glad that you're here. My name is Reverend Steph Maxson. I'm the pastor here at Redeemer Metropolitan Community Church. And let's just say you were scrolling around or you hit or heard a beep and you clicked on it and you were here and you're like, oh, I don't think I meant to go there. Well, let me tell you, you're at the right place at the right time. So sit right back and um, join us for today's message. Um, I would like to thank LaDonna for being our hostess today. And so she is out there greeting each and every one of you. And LaDonna, thanks again for, for helping out. I really appreciate that. So today, I, let's see, I'm not really sure how to say this. I, um, how about if I say it this way? I pray that today, tonight, sort of, if you will, kicks off and continues that work in you that God wants to do in your heart and what God wants to do in your mind and what he wants to revol revolutionize in your life, that chains that he wants to break off of your life, spirituality, deliverance that he wants to bring, freedom and victory that he wants to speak over your life. And the fact that you have joined us this week, and not only this week, but the past weeks, in and out uh, on social media since the pandemic has kept us from worshiping together, I think that indicates that you are serious about this, that you didn't come to play games. Instead, you want to see and you want to hear the voice of God. Would you please join me in prayer? Lord, come and speak to us. Help us to step out of the way of us because we need a word from you, Lord. I'm so grateful for each person joining us today or even during our replay. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. And together we say, amen. So it was the 1940s or so, and there was a professor in England. His name was Professor Orr. He taught theology at a university there. And he decided to take some of his theology students on, a, on an excursion, on a field trip, so to speak. F field trips and seminary are just awesome. And so he gathered up his students and he said, all right, we're going to go visit some of the historical places here in England that have some sort of theological significance. He took them to many religious sites that were strategic in the building up of the church and in Christian faith. And one of the places that they visited was the Epworth Rectory, which would have been the home, the living space, the study place of one of the great reformers of the church. And his name was John Wesley. John Wesley sort of put in place much of the theology upon which the church that you and I attend, a lot of that foundational theology was crafted by reformers like John Wesley. John Wesley would study, he would teach, he would preach. He would pray that revival would spread out, not only in England, but he prayed for it here in the USA. And he prayed that revival would break out. Well, he and others like him, they ushered in through prayer some of the great revivals that swept through America in the early 1900s, where people in masses were coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord where the heavens seemed to just open up in an unusual way and revival broke out in a way that has made the history books, or in other words, they made it into the history books. We still look back on that era and recognize the fire of God's spirit that spread during that time period. And it's because guys, and I presume women too, many of them like John Wesley, were on their knees praying that God would move. So, these theology students went and they visited this rectory, this house where he lived. And they went in the kitchen where Professor Orr showed them all of where John would have, you know, he would have eaten his lunch and his dinners and where he would have cooked and where he would have lived his life. And then the professor took him into the study where John Wesley would have studied. 
these theology students were enamored because, of course, some of the old books that John Wesley would have studied from that he had written in, you know, taken notes in the margins, and some of those notes they had preserved, they were still there on the desk and on the bookshelves. And so the theology students were feeling the spines of, of those books, just enjoying the richness of his history. Next, Professor Orr walked the students up to the second floor where the most intimate quarters of John Wesley would have been, his bedroom. The students walked in the bedroom and began to file around the bed in a tiny space in that bedroom. And as they all filled into the room, one of them noticed as they got around the far side of the bed that there were two small worn patches in the carpet, carpet fibers of the floor. They were right next to each other and they were beside the bed. And one of the students asked his professor about those patches that were worn right there beside the bed. And Professor Orr explained that those two patches were the actual places where every single morning, not for a minute or two, but for several hours on end, John Wesley would plant his knees right beside his bed. And he had prayed so hard and so long for revival that his knees had actually imprinted themselves onto the floor, that the carpet fibers were worn as he prayed for revival. After a few moments, the students left the room. They went downstairs and they all got on the bus to go to the next location. And Professor Orr, he stood there at the front of the bus, you know, counting the students to make sure everybody was there. And he realized one was missing. And he walked back into the house and he went into the kitchen to look for the student and nobody was there. He went into the study to look for the student. Nobody was there. He walked up the stairs into the bedroom and he could just see across the other side of the bed, the head and the shoulders of a student who had planted his knees down in those well-worn patches on the floor. And he could hear the student praying, do it again, Lord. Lord, would you do it again? And would you do it again with me? Professor Orr walked around the side of the bed. He put his hand on the shoulder of the student and he said, it's time to go. In rising from his knees, Billy Graham went and joined the rest of the students on the bus that day. And then God did it again. And I just wonder what would happen if there were some people who were brave enough to say, Lord, would you do it again? Would you not allow me to be a Christian in name only? Would you make it so that I'm uncomfortable with being a normal or Christian who just comes to church, who just reads a verse a day to keep the devil away, who's just a good person but isn't a person who is completely sold out for the cause of Jesus Christ? Lord, would you make it so that I'm different and unique and set apart and filled by the Spirit of God? Lord, would you do it again? And would you let it start with me? Yes, I'm praying for revival. And I'm talking about the straight up, old school, old fashioned, whatever you want to call it. I'm talking about where the Holy Spirit breaks out so clearly and so fully that there is not one person that walks the face of the earth that does not know that there is a God somewhere and that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us from our sins, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no person comes to the Father except through him. Lord, do it again, and you might as well go ahead and start at Redeemer MCC in Flint. Revival is what we're asking them for. It's a unique outpouring of the presence of God. It's when his spirit, the immaterial, in some way becomes material, tangible, 
where we see and hear and we can detect traces of God's presence. It's where you look back over your history and you could see footprints where God was working stuff out in your favor, where he was putting the right people in the right place at the right time to guide your steps. It's when you step away from just celebrating his omni omnipresence. I'm grateful for the omnipresence of God. Omnipresence means that God is everywhere at the same time. Omnipresence means when we sign off today, I'm not taking all of God with me and I'm not leaving all of God with you. God is just as much in Otisville as he is in, in Genesee, as he is in Flint and Waterford and Grand Rapids and Tennessee and Florida, as he will be with me in Grand Blank because our God is omnipresent. But there should be a hunger in us, the people of God, to want more than just his omnipresence. We should want his manifest presence. Manifest is revival. It's his clear outpouring. It's the detecting of his fingerprints in all of our lives. It's when we hear his voice by his spirit whispering to us and speaking to us. And this has always been the desire of God to reveal himself. That's what revival is. It's a revelation. It's a revealing of the tangible experience with God. And that's what God has always wanted. Even in Isaiah 65, you know, way back in the Old Testament. God said, listen, even when people didn't want me, I was still trying to reveal myself. I permitted myself to be sought by those who didn't even ask for me. I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am to a people that did not even call on my name. I wanted to bring revival even when people weren't asking for it. And so all throughout the scriptures, from the Old Testament all the way into the New, we find a God who wanted to be found by his people. He wanted to reveal himself. And do you know what great lengths he went to to reveal himself to you and to me? Think about it. All of history really is a chronicling of God's desire to be seen and experienced and felt in a tangible, real way, to be in relationship with every single one of us. It started in the garden, you know, Adam and Eve. He sent them down in a perfect environment so they could have a perfect relationship with him. But you know, we have a very real enemy that has always worked against revival the revealing of God. And so even then, he slithered into the perfect environment and introduced sin, and they bit the apple. And sin didn't just enter into that perfect environment, but into the DNA of sin was passed down to all humanity for all time. And it seemed like all hope was lost, but our God never to be outdone. He stepped in and had another move because Adam and Eve, they came together and they had a little baby boy named Seth. And then Seth gave birth to Enoch. And Genesis chapter 4 says that when he, Enoch, was born, everybody began to worship God again. The enemy, he wanted to try to stand against the revealing of God, the revelation of God, the relationship of God to humanity. And so he made it so that sin was introduced and perpetuated and proliferated throughout humanity. Things got so bad that the entire human race really needed to be wiped out. And it seemed like the enemy had the upper hand and he was going to win. But our God, never to be outdone. He went and he found a man named Noah. And he said, Noah, I want you to build me an ark. And Noah said, a what? God said, an ark. 
because one day it's going to rain. And Noah said, it's going to what? And God said, it's going to rain. And so Noah built an ark. Didn't even know what it was for. For rain, he had never seen it before. But in obedience to God, his ark became the carrier through which God would preserve all of humanity. And once again, our God, always, he was on top. But the enemy caused sin to proliferate. And again, the attitudes of people hardened against the one true God. And things looked so dire that it had looked as if the enemy had won. But our God, never to be outdone, he went to a little obscure town and found an obscure man named Abram. He plucked him out of a town called Herb. He set him on a brand new path. He changed his name. He changed the, the GPS coordinates on his ambitions and the trajectory of his life. And he said, through you, Abraham, I'm going to make a brand new people called the children of Israel. They will be my people. I will mark them with my presence. I will make a covenant with them so that you can't mess with them, no matter how hard it is that you try. So the children of Israel were crafted as an opportunity for God to maintain relationship with humanity, no matter what the enemy would try. But the enemy, of course, the enemy wanted to do everything he could to keep revival, to keep revelation, to keep the revealing of God from happening fully with humanity. And so Israel was enslaved for 400 years. They were enslaved down in Egypt, and it looked like all hope was lost. But our God, never to be outdone. He made it so that there was a little boy named Moses that was raised as the prince of Egypt. And at just the right time, he said to Moses, Mo, you go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh's heart was softened. And he released the children of Israel. And after 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years of coming into intimate relationship with their God, they finally came into the promised land. And it looked like the enemy had been beaten forever. But the enemy, he had another move up his sleeve. Because he made it so that the idols of their new land looked as appealing as the one true God. And so they began to worship idols. And when you get to the end of the book of Judges, the last line says, everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. <laughs> Kind of sounds like America in the year 2021, doesn't it? And it looked like the enemy was going to have the final say. But our God, never to be outdone. Type that in the comment section. Our God, never to be outdone. Our God, never to be outdone. He went and he found a woman named Ruth. And Ruth married Boaz. She and Boaz had a, a baby named Obed. And Obed gave birth to Jesse. And Jesse gave birth to a little baby boy named David. That's King David. The one who the prophets had already prophesied. And through that lineage, there would be one born who would settle this matter once and for all. The people that were on the stage of the world in that moment did not even know that they were already in place for a historical move for which the enemy would never have a response for. The Old Testament closed. 400 years of silence passed. And then... The curtain opened and Jesus stepped on the scene. And that is the response that the enemy has never been able to tackle. God the Father revealed himself in the Old Testament. And then Jesus came in the New Testament. Jesus was the physical embodiment of God the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yahweh, he tried to make it so that 
He could have relationship with people as boldly as he could in the Old Testament. And then he came into the New Testament in the person of Jesus. In every dispensation, he tried to figure out the best way to make it so that he could reveal himself to humanity. God the Father in the Old Testament, Jesus the Son in the New Testament. And at every stage, people rejected the revelation that God gave them up of himself. One scholar said it this way, that the great sin of the Old Testament is that they did not believe in God the Father. The great sin of the New Testament is that they did not believe in Jesus the Son. And the great sin of our generation is that we really don't believe in the Holy Spirit. But on every turn, when Jesus our God seeks to reveal himself, we always question the way he seeks to reveal himself to us. Jesus came in the New Testament. The word made flesh and he dwelt among them. Listen to John describe this beholding of Jesus. He said in John chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Listen to the awe in his voice as he says it. And we beheld his glory. I mean, John can't believe it. The glory of God the Father we saw with our own eyes. We got an up-close, personal, front-row seat an in-person experience. We got to hear the words come out of his mouth, to hear him teach, to see him heal and prophesy and tell people to repent because the kingdom of God was at hand. We got to see him for ourselves. I love how Eugene Peterson puts that verse in the message version of the Bible. He says, Jesus came and moved into the neighborhood of humanity that he came to move into your neighborhood, into my neighborhood. That's revival, that he came to make himself present, to walk publicly among the people so that they could experience what it was like to be in the very presence of God. And so he performed miracles and he taught so he could authenticate that he was who he said he was and that he could do exactly what he said he could do. And not everybody believed him. They weren't convinced, just like the people weren't convinced in the Old Testament. They weren't convinced about Jesus in the New Testament. They weren't sure about this Messiah business. But what they did know was that everywhere Jesus showed up, blind people could see. What they did know even though they weren't sure about the whole kingdom of God as at hand stuff, what they did know was that when this Jesus showed up, lame people could walk, the deaf could hear, and the dead were being raised. And everywhere Jesus showed up, and every time he spoke, his words were dripping with awe and with an authority that they had never, ever heard before. They'd heard the Pharisees and the Sadducees the religious leaders that had been nice, but they never heard anything like this. And so wherever Jesus went, it says throngs of people were crowded around him because they wanted to get as close as they possibly could. You know, like the woman with the issue of blood who forced her way through a crowd because she wanted to get as close as she could so she could reach out and touch the hem of his garment because she knew if she could just touch him, that power would leave him and come to her and heal her of all her diseases. They weren't sure about whether or not he was the Messiah, but they knew he was something. And God tried to reveal himself once again, Jesus walking amongst the people which is why one of the scariest, one of the most troubling one-liners in all of Scripture is John chapter 11, verse 54. And I said all of that to get us to John chapter 11, verse 54. I want to give you a minute to get there. 
I know a lot of people, they, they kind of pick up the Bible and they're like, ah, I don't even know where that is, you know? It's like you're talking Greek to me. Well, half the Bible is in Greek, but anyway. Um, so you've got your table of contents in the very front, okay? And it's broken up into either two, possibly three sections. The first section, it lists the Old Testament. There might be a middle section that lists the Gospels. There might be a third section that says the New Testament. Or it might be broken up in the Old and the New Testament. And the New Testament is going to start with the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So look through your table of contents. We're in the book of John, chapter 11. And we're going to read two verses, I think. I think it's going to be 54 and 55. Or it's 53 and 54. I don't remember. But it says, Therefore, Jesus no longer walked publicly among the Jews. And that is the troubling one-liner in all of Scripture. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked publicly among the Jews. He went away. One of the most troubling portions of all the Scripture is that Jesus no longer went public. He was present. He was there. He just wasn't public. He was around, but he just chose to stave off into more quiet corners instead of walking publicly among the people. No more miracles, no more teaching out in public. People wouldn't be privy to the revival, to the revelation of himself as he had come to give. No, he was no longer, or he no longer walked publicly amongst the people. So, I have a question for you. Are we living in a time where he is no longer walking publicly among us? He's present. He just isn't public. Because the people of God have gotten so private and so quiet. We are Christians. We're just not public with our Christianity that the Jesus that people are supposed to see in you, the Jesus that people are supposed to see in me, they're looking, but they just can't find him. He's present. He's just not public. So this little portion of scripture bothered me so much because I, I, I wanted to figure out what is it that keeps Jesus from being revealed? that keeps the revival from happening? Why is it that Jesus would be present amongst the people, but that he wouldn't walk publicly among them? I was really bothered by this, especially since verses 55 and 56 says, well, I'll, I'll just read them to you from chapter John. We're still in 11, right? It says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleaning before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, what do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? See, they're all standing in the temple, and they're looking for Jesus, and he's nowhere to be found. They're in the place where if there's any place Jesus is going to be, it's going to be in the temple, and they're looking for him and they cannot find him. What an indictment against the church of Jesus Christ. If when people come through our doors, be it online or in person, if they come into this place, they can find Bible study and, and laughter and fellowship and, and solid biblical teaching. Or how about maybe some larger churches where they can find programs and they can find you know mission statements and they can find great teaching and they can find great singing and they can find lights and cameras and beautiful stages and they can find everything except the one who will actually change their lives and there are people who are coming into churches all over the world and they're looking for Jesus they might not even really know how to verbalize what they're after they just know that there's a void in their lives that needs to be filled. They need something that can quench them at their very core. And they come in looking, not for our plans, not for the programs. They're looking for the presence of God. 
The presence of God is what people are seeking. It's what we all need. And these people are looking for Jesus, but Jesus is no longer walking publicly among them. The presence of God, revival, is what people have always been after since the beginning of time. There's a, or I should say, there, there was a Bible study teacher named Elizabeth Elliot, and she died a while back now. And she gave years and years of her life as a faithful service to God. And I've read some of her books, and, and I've listened to her on the radio program every now and then. And she was the, the kind of speaker or teacher that she was, well, she was fairly bland. Like, there were no jo jokes. She wasn't going to crack a smile. You know, she wasn't going to try to entertain you. She didn't really care if you liked her. What she was saying, or what she was not saying, she would just stand up there. And literally, she would just talk. Just like this for a solid hour. One time, someone asked her, Why is it? that in your teaching style, I've noticed that you don't feel the need for a whole lot of anecdotes or, or jokes or something like that. You don't seem to need to warm up the crowd. And Miss Elizabeth, she was probably in her late 70s by then. She looked back at the woman who asked the question with a little smile on her face. And she said, well, why would I do that? The people didn't come to see me, they came to see Jesus. And I thought to myself, well, well then. <laughs> the reality is, is they don't need to see you and they don't need to see me. They need Jesus. They need to see Jesus. He's the one that changes lives. He literally sets people free. He gives people victory. He breaks chains on people's lives. He opens up blind eyes. He opens up deaf ears. He can change the trajectory of your entire life. And honestly, there's no telling where I'd be if it were not for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So I stand here before you today, not because I'm a preacher, it's because I'm a satisfied customer of the grace and the goodness of God. God has changed my life. So the people were looking for Jesus and they couldn't find him. And I wanted to know why. Why wasn't he there? Well, it turns out this happens in John chapter 11 right on the heels of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. I'm sure you know the story. Jesus walks in four days after Lazarus has already been dead, and Mary and Martha are like, where have you been? I mean, seriously. And Jesus says, don't worry about it. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'll take care of this. And he calls Lazarus out of the tomb. And he says, loose that man and let him go. And Lazarus comes forth in the sitting, or I'm sorry, in the sighting of people who were gathered that day. Some believe in Jesus. Some are a little critical of him. Because, you know, people are always critical when Jesus reveals himself. And so some people, they go to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and they have a, you know, a little word to say about what Jesus is doing out here, performing miracles and stuff. And it says that the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they convene a council to scrutinize the work of Jesus. Theologian A.W. Tozer says that when Jesus moves, when God moves, when he does stuff that's outside of the box of our comfort zone, there is always one of two responses. The unbelieving person will squat down to their knees only to get a better look so that they can be critical of and scrutinize that which God has done. But the believing person might also drop to their knees. But they will do so only so that they can turn their attention upward with their hands raised and say, thank you. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they drop to their knees to get a closer look, to scrutinize. And in their pride and in their arrogance, they say, Jesus is doing too much. We can't let him as if they could control him. 
We can't let him go on this way because if we do, he will ruin our plans. And so they set out, it says in John chapter 11, verse 3, it says that they make a decision to kill him. They decide he needs to be silenced. He needs to be muted. He needs to be squelched. His moves need to be suffocated so that they can get a handle on him and make him less than and diminish him. They want to do whatever it is they can to kill the work of God. And so they silence him any way they can. And it says that as a result of their decision, Jesus no longer walked publicly among them. So I want to ask you, is there any way in any part of your life where you know you are silencing, you are diminishing, you are minimizing, you are extinguishing the moves of God in your own personal experience. I'm talking about where you've heard the voice of God. You know it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit saying, you know, apologize to that person or give to that person or go there or don't go here. Participate in that. Don't participate in this. And you just keep silent and walking away from it, ignoring it, going the other direction from it doing everything you can to minimize what you know is the work of God inside you and around you. When we decide and choose individually to kill his work, to smother his work in our life, the scripture says his response is to no longer walk publicly among you. He's present. He's just not public. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You can't be unsaved once you've already been saved and placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You are eternally secure for heaven. You don't have to worry about that. But just because he's present doesn't mean he's public. And he came to be more. He wants you to experience him on the outside of you in the way you think and in the choices that you make and in the in the in the paths of your life. He wants you to see him working publicly around you in the different experiences of your life. So if you, like me, want to experience more than just his omnipresence, if you want his manifest presence, the thing that he came for, then we have to be careful that we're not squelching and diminishing the moves of God in our life. Because any place in our life where we have determined to kill him, he will see, we will see, that he no longer walks publicly among us. And so Jesus no longer publicly among them. We must be devoted to letting Jesus do what Jesus wants to do and giving him margin to move freely among us, to be public among us. We need to be praying for integrity and character in our life. And if I may be so bold in the life of your pastor and the board of directors, we need to be praying that there are people who are leading us, who are watching over us, who are faithful to do it the way that would most honor a great move and revival of God in the house of God. So in the Old Testament, he came as God the Father. In the New Testament, he came as Jesus the Son. And just like he wanted to move publicly in the Old Testament and move publicly in the New Testament through Jesus, when Jesus finally ascended into heaven, he said to the disciples, it is to your advantage that I go because when I go, I'm going to leave with you another helper. Now in the original language, another helper is a word that actually means another of the exact same kind, meaning I am not leaving you with a lesser version of myself. Everything you had in me, all of the authority and all of the grandeur and all of the greatness of God, the Father that is in me, is now 
in the, in the person of the Holy Spirit. And I'm leaving the Holy Spirit of God with you in 2021. So that just as God wanted to reveal himself in the Old Testament, and just as Jesus the Son wanted to walk publicly in the New Testament, we now have every right and privilege as sons and daughters in this dispensation in which he has left the Holy Spirit to experience the full presence of God among us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Boom! Mic drop. Did you know that when you place acceptance, uh, accepted Jesus, you also received the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is not a ghost or a wind or a fire or a dove. The Holy Spirit is often symbolized by those things. The Holy Spirit is the third entity, the third person, if you will, of the Trinity. Not third, meaning least in value. Third, because the Holy Spirit is the last to be revealed to us in the pages of Scripture. But all of the fullness, all of the power, all of the glory, all of the grandeur of God the Father is in the person of the Holy Spirit. So when you place faith in Jesus and the Holy Spirit takes up residence in you. That means that all of the grandeur, all of the goodness, all of the authority of God now lives on the inside of you. And God doesn't just want to be present. God wants to be public. That's why you get his fruit. Because that means, for example, when your patience has run out with that person, you don't have any more patience, right? God gives you the fruit of the Spirit so you can have patience that goes beyond your natural capacity to have patience. Not only do you have the fruit of the Spirit that's public, you also have the gifts of the Spirit so that you can operate in a way that publicly edifies the body of Christ and builds people up and encourages them and stirs them on. It's God's public activity in your life. It's called the manifest presence of God. The person of the Holy Spirit enables us as the body of Christ to walk in a manner worthy of the calling by which we have been called. It's the presence of God on our life. It marks us. It means people can see a public demonstration of the power of God just because we walked into the room on our jobs and, and maybe in your college and when you're walking down the hallways of your high school and in that organization that you're involved in and in that endeavor in which you are sowing all of your gifts and your talents and your creative abilities, you've given it everything that you have. The Holy Spirit is the one that when whose presence is upon your life makes it so that when you walk into a room People get a public demonstration of Jesus because of the words you say, because of the choices that you make, because of the integrity with which you stand, because of the character with which you walk, because of the way that you were able to bring Christ's love to bear with every person, even the difficult person, that you know, that you're able to love and give generously and, and sow yourself into every good deed to which God calls you not by your own power and not by your own light, but by the Spirit of God who operates not only in you, but upon your life. That's called favor. Favor is God's presence on your life. Favor is what opens up doors that no human being can shake. Uh, favor is, the, is, is what puts you in possessions or or. or is what puts you in positions that nobody really thinks you're qualified for. Favor is what he enables you to do. Things that you know are beyond your capacity. But God has positioned you and placed you and prepared a way for you that's favored on your life. If you have the Holy Spirit of God, you have favor. So I'm going to tell you this before I close. If there's one thing that invites the favor of God on your life, of course, if you've received Christ as your Savior, He is in you. But I'm talking about where 
He's on you, visible, public. People can sense the presence of God because you have peace that passes understanding. Like when people know what you're going through in your life and they can't figure out how you still have sanity with what you got going on in your life. You know, we've seen interviews on the television from people in Texas where last I, last I heard 60 lives had been lost because they don't know how to deal with the warmth. People have frozen to death. And then you see people in lines for water because they're on a boil water and not everybody even has the means to do that. And some of the interviews of people receiving that water is like, I am so blessed that God has brought me here. Thank you. I am so pleased. You know, you, you don't see them all just being frustrated and angry and annoyed. You see them with the peace that passes all understanding. They have that craziness going on in their life. And yet, you know that they've got God in their life. And there's one thing that invites the presence of God on you like that. You ready? Here it is. It's called holiness. You gotta live holy. Just for the record, I never said any of this stuff was easy. It's difficult at best. We might take a step forward and take three steps back, but that's when we go back into our prayer closet and we say, God help me. And you come back out and you receive his help. Receive his help to live a holy life. Because you've got to decide to lay aside every sin and the weight of which so easily entangles you so that you can run with endurance the race that has been set before you. You can be in your own war room praying against the schemes of the devil until you're blue in the face. But if you leave your prayer closet and still live a raggedy, wayward lifestyle, then the enemy you just prayed against will still make himself at home in your life. You gotta live holy. I'm talking about integrity. I'm talking about being the same person in the dark as you are in the light. I'm talking about character where we don't just come in here on a Sunday uh, uh, hearing about the promise of, of God and the truths of God and then we walk out the doors or we hit the sign off button, right? And, and then nobody aligns their life in a way that is actually congruent with everything that you think, say, and do. There's going to be something that the Lord is going to give to your life and you're going to have to decide up front whether or not you are willing whether or not I'm willing to align my life with the truth that God gives us and to the extent that we're willing to say yes and bring ourselves into alignment. That's holiness. That's the extent to which we will see him go public in our lives. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of just having a private Jesus I mean, I'm so grateful that he's present, but I want in public Jesus. I want what I get in, the, in, the, in, in preparing the message and in even hearing the message. I want that to come to the pavement of my experience that when I walk down the road of life, I walk with him, I see him move, I experience him. I want that holy anticipation that comes because I'm eager to see what God's gonna do today. I want to wake up with holy expectation that today I'm going to see a move of God. Today I have expectation that he's coming to do something that is far beyond anything that I can ask for. Think now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond. To him be the glory in this church now and forevermore. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody say, Amen. Amen and amen. Would you please pray with me? 
Holy and awesome God, would you help us in our prayer rooms? Would you help us open up ourselves to have the movement of the Holy Spirit within us to be evident, to have a public Jesus, to help us come together, to lead us into a revival that where anybody, those that we come into contact with, they see a public you in us and they can tell it in the way we walk and in the way we speak and in the way that we carry ourselves. Dear God, help us, lead us, and guide us. And together we say, amen. If you would like to financially support us in spreading the word of God, you may do so in a couple of different ways. Um, the first one is that you may download an app. It's a free app and it's called Give Lifey, G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y, Give Lifey. And then you can search for Redeemer Metropolitan Community Church, and then, you know, make sure you save that little heart button so that you don't ever have to search for us again. We'll be right there at your fingertips. And then you may use your credit card to um, give of your uh, gift or offering or tithes, um, your, your donation. And another way is you may write a check to Redeemer Metropolitan Community Church of Flint. And you may mail that to uh, the same name, Redeemer MCC of Flint, 2474 South Ballinger Highway, Flint, Michigan, 48507. I'm so glad that you stopped in to join us today. And if you would like to have a uh, prayer one-on-one, -on -one, I would encourage you to um, leave a message in the comments section and uh, our hostess LaDonna will get a hold of me and we will contact you and have prayer with you. Know that you are loved, um, not only by myself, but more importantly, by God. And may God be with you. Peace, love, signing off. <laughs>